So this is my uh, salmon fly survival guide presentation. And you guys have probably heard bits and pieces of this before. Uh, maybe you heard it last year. It won't be the same as last year, of course. It'll be uh, somewhat different, I hope. Um, I am definitely um, a trout fisherman. I love the Deschutes. It's, you know, it's really where I cut my teeth with fly fishing. Uh, going to Mecca, you know, when I was 19 years old, let's say. So um, I'm 45 this year. This is my 22nd or 23rd actual salmon fly hatch that I'll have fished on my own. Um, so I've done it a few times. Uh, I've guided it quite a bit. Um, I still remember the first trout that I caught on a salmon fly. And, you know, it uh, brings back great memories. And every time I float by that spot, I, I think of it, especially during uh, the salmon fly hatch. Um, and a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about today, you know, are maybe things that are common sense, maybe not, maybe things that we don't really think about too much and, you know, maybe overlook. Um, you know, I work at a fly shop and I guide, so I'm kind of a, a gear junkie at heart. So, you know, a lot of times when I go out, I take, you know, more than one rod. I take a lot of flies. I take, you know, different kinds of leaders. And I think that that kind of gear junkie aspect has definitely been one aspect that's helped me improve with the salmon fly hatch. Um, and if you guys read today's newsletter, you saw there was uh, an article uh, in, the, in the blog post that was uh, 10 tips from Randy uh, Stetzer and from uh, Brian, and then I did my 10 tips. Uh, so a lot of those things we're kind of going to talk about again here uh, tonight and, and kind of relive a little bit. Uh, but if you haven't been to um, a salmon fly hatch on the Deschutes, it's a, a pretty enjoyable event. And, you know, when it's when it's rocking, you know, there's the bushes are stuck again. Yeah, just open up again, now go. That basically anytime you grab a bush, you can get a handful just like this. And this <laughs> particular day was uh, just a few days from now. This is May uh, 10th from last year. So um, early on, you know, last year we had a lot of big bugs. They were in the bushes everywhere. Um, you can see just in this picture, there's uh, golden stone in the bottom left and a lot of the giant salmon flies. The Deschutes has a, a lot of different stone flies that hatch. You know, in the, the fall, you have those flightless stone flies where the males don't have any wings. Uh, throughout the wintertime, we get those little black stones that are like a size, you know, kind of 18. We have these golden stones and giant salmon flies and uh, followed by little yellow sallies. And I'm sure there's many more uh, subspecies of stoneflies that hatch that, you know, that don't get talked about or they're not prevalent enough to, to really make a difference. But uh, there's a lot of different ones out there and, and it really is just a, a great hatch. And, you know, especially this year, winter steelhead fishing was a challenge to say the least. Uh, there were are people that are logged in that I fished with a few times this year. And we had difficult fishing, great conditions, you know, not a lot of fish. And I know as the season was kind of winding down for me from winter steelheading, I'm like, thank God this is getting to be the end because I'm ready to catch a fish. And trout fishing is definitely like that bright shining star where, you know, it kicks off with the salmon fly hatch and, you know, it's getting warm and nice and it's like a new day is dawning and it's getting sunny and warm and it's spring. And so this is kind of like a very bright spot for me. Uh, so I'm definitely looking forward to the, to the salmon fly hatch. And, you know, for me, I think about the salmon fly hatch and it's, it's really a big party. You know, it's a, a party that lasts for about a month. Um, you know, it's kind of a pin to a festival 
people come from all over the place. There's a lot of debauchery. Um, there's a lot of fishing, you know, bull trout, as you can see in this bottom right hand picture, get into it. Um, er everyone's excited for the big bugs and wants to enjoy that party. Um, and I, I know that I certainly am into it. Um, the salmon fly hatch is, you know, it's kind of like the greatest show on earth in my mind. Um, there's big bugs, uh, big eats, big splashy ones. Basically, at, really at no other time in the year are big fish so stupid and willing to just readily eat your big dry fly that, that they don't even care. I mean, this is probably the time that you catch the most big fish on top just time after time. And on occasion, the big fish are so greedy that you'll catch one and it'll have other salmon flies hanging out of its mouth, just gorging on one after another. And it just needs another. It's, you know, it's like a little kid, if you give him a bag of candy, he's just shoving it all in there. And the, the big trout seem to have a tendency to do that at this time as well. So, um, you know, it's just one of those things that just gets better and better as, as the hatch progresses. Now, the bad news is the hatch is a short lived, you know, it's, three, four weeks, whatever. Um, but it, it is just one of the best times. So I'm gonna start off with this little video and probably a lot of you have seen it. This video to me kind of is the epitome of what the salmon fly hatch is. You know, you're, you're crouched down on the bank, you're under the overhanging alders, there's no overhead cast. You know, you're having to do a sidearm you're trying to shoot it up under the bushes. You know, maybe your first cast goes into the bushes and you yank it out. The second cast goes into the tree. Maybe your third cast lands in the right place. Maybe the fish eats it, maybe it doesn't. Um, but it is just, it takes every bit of your kind of fly fishing ability really at this time to make it happen. So let's watch Jeremy here. And this guy is the merman which we see them in a lot of. Beautiful. Eat it, eat it, eat it, so eat, it, eat, it, eat it, eat it, eat it, eat it, eat it. There and it is. It came up a second time and the angler missed it. So, you know, not always is it uh, a win-win. And you can see that Jeremy's fly ended up in the, in the alders that were overhead. Well, he didn't get the fish to come back and he didn't get the fish in general. But the thing is, this is a kind of a hard spot to fish. But if you don't fish these spots, you miss fishing these spots and you miss what those fish have to offer. So we'll kind of, as we move through this presentation, we'll kind of talk about these things and, and how to do better at this kind of situation maybe um, and what I think it takes to, to get there. Um, so if you have an experience this hatch, if this is the first hatch that you will partake in, um, it's a it's truly a mind-boggling experience. I mean, there's bugs like crawling out of the bushes, flying and landing on your neck and down your shirt, and you know you're getting covered in bugs and you're flicking them off, and the next thing you know, one's trying to crawl into your ear. You know, they just seem to be everywhere and they're creepy and crawly, and as they get on you for the day, you go home and you can't help but think there's one crawling down your shirt again later that night. Um, but if you can put up with it, it is just one of the greatest times in the year. So right now we're into the, the nymph migration. And in the springtime, all these golden stones and giant salmon flies, Terranarsis and um, the little yellow sallies are all migrating and making their way uh, towards the shore where they're going to hatch. And as they are getting ready, they're staging up just, you know, a foot off the bank, two feet off the bank, and they're on the bottom of these rocks, just kind of biding their time uh, for when the water warms up and the air temperature so that they can just crawl out and start to hatch. Now, if you've been over to the Deschutes in the past few days, uh, they are starting to crawl out. They're not in huge numbers yet, but every day there's more than the day before. And so right now is the very beginning. 
So if you're over there fishing and they're not keyed in on the big bugs, uh, nymphing a big stonefly is going to be the the ticket. Uh, has been for a long time. The, those giant stoneflies like that black coffin stone or whatever fly you choose to use, the the big black ones um, live in the rivers, you know, for up to three years before they um, come to maturity and hatch. Uh, golden stones not as long, and so. A stonefly, even after the hatch, is not a bad pattern to fish throughout the year. A lot of times, you know, now euro nymphing is popular, so we're fishing a little bit smaller bug on the on the euro nymph setup. But fishing it under an indicator is deadly. Uh, try swinging it through the riffles. That's another really good way to do it. Um, for me, I fish just mostly a black one. Uh, I tie it in the round so it can tumble. Uh, the the Giant stoneflies are terrible swimmers, so having a bug that you that kind of tumbles through the rocks is going to give you a little bit of an advantage. Um, but kind of anything that you want to use, and and then over the next few days, that fishing in close with the the big stonefly nymph is going to just be lights out, fantastic. So this is today, last year. How cool is that? And that's basically, I just turned over one rock and saw that there was 10 or 12 of them sitting on it. This is the boat launch at Mecca. And I just basically turned the rock over, saw them scattering, and just used both hands to scoop them up. And that's what I came up with. Um, but you can see those suckers are pretty big, um, two and a half inches long, probably. Those are all big, giant stoneflies. Um, but kind of fun to see that and have it and hold them in your hand. So if you have seen this or haven't seen it, it's pretty interesting. Um, the, the majority of the hatch takes place late in the day and in, in, in the night overnight uh, where the bugs crawl out and hatch um, in the evening. And, you know, I don't know exactly why that is, if the weather is the calmest or if it's cooled off enough that it's not too hot. Um, but a lot of times you're in camp, there's not very many bugs. You wake up in the next morning and it's bugs everywhere. So basically what happens is they're going to crawl out. They, their exoskeleton, their shuck dries out. It splits open and they kind of wiggle out of it. And as they wiggle out of it, their wings are kind of crushed down and they look like wrinkled up tissue paper. And as they fill with blood, they straighten out and uh, kind of dry out and, and are able to fly and crawl around. And they kind of just move off into the bushes and bide their time and mate and, and, and fly off. Um, but after the salmon fly hatch, you can see up in this left-hand slide, uh, there's another shuck right behind this salmon fly. Um, but the shucks will just be everywhere. So this is a... a fence post down below Mecca, and it's covered in little golden stone shucks. And this is, you know, a month after the hatch has happened. But really interesting to see that that happen. And it's kind of nice that you get that memory of the hatch for quite some time. So this is a, a quick little video of one of them crawling out, and you can kind of see what I was talking about. Their wings are all curled up as it's just come out of that shuck. The blood's not quite in there yet. Uh, their wings haven't expanded fully. And that just takes a little while. The pro whole process of them being able to crawl out of that, of that husk takes a pretty good amount of time. Uh, really interesting, if you're over there in the next, you know, 10 days, you can spot quite a few of them doing it. And it's, it's just kind of fun to watch it and see it happen. So. Like I said, I have been doing the salmon fly hatch for, this. I think this is my 23rd year, something like that. I think 97 was the first one I did. Um, and, you know, I was having this conversation with Randy Stetzer, who, you know, has been guiding on the Deschutes since before I was born. And um, so, you know, I refer to the old days on the Deschutes as before the mixing tower. 
and he always thinks I'm saying the old days, like I'm talking about the fifties or sixties or something, but uh, like, it's kind of a slide on him. But so for me, the old days are before the mixing tower and the modern times are after the mixing tower. And, you know, there was a, in the old days, the salmon fly hatch, you know, started May 15th, 20th, something like that, maybe a little earlier, maybe a little later and went till basically the 4th of July. Uh, I could, would basically set my clock by uh, the salmon fly hatch being Memorial Day weekend every year up until this happened. And, you know, it was a great time and, and I, I kind of missed that it happened, that it has changed the time. Uh, now we get it and it happens like today and it happens just extremely fast. But if in the old days, these are kind of the things that everyone would tell you is, you know, May 20th to the 4th of July, fish right next to the bank. That's where the fish are. All you need is a really short leader and all you need is a chubby Chernobyl. Or in the old days, it was like a sofa pillow um, and fish a dry dropper. And in my mind, yeah, those are all viable options. But for me, well, the first part's thrown out the window. But the other stuff is kind of like, yeah, I'm going to do that a little bit, but that's not the sole way that I'm going to catch fish. And if I, if everyone is doing this, these techniques that I rattled off, I'll probably find a lot of success in doing other things than that. And so a lot of what I'm going to talk about tonight is going to be my other things. And I see that there was a direct message, but I can't get my message chat board to pop up. But I think it says, does the hatch move upstream? Um, in the old days, the hatch did move upstream and it would start at the mouth and work its way up. And now it kind of happens. It still works its way up because it's definitely more in mopping right now, but it happens almost all at once. It kind of explodes in the river from top to bottom. And what is a little bit different is that it actually will happen in patches. And so I don't know about what is happening north of Maupin. So from Maupin to Shears Falls um, or Maupin to the mouth, I'm not typically fishing that area. The range that I roam mostly is from Warm Springs uh, down to Trout Creek, and then from Trout Creek down to Harpham Flats. And so during the salmon fly hatch, um, so from today till, you know, June 10th, let's say, June 7th, whatever, I'll probably spend 20 days in that stretch. And what I'll see is when I push away from Trout Creek, I'll get down to the, my first spot that I'm going to fish, which will be like Hobo Camp, you know, somewhere in their upper red sides. And there will be a good hatch and bugs everywhere. And then I'll float down like 100 yards, 200 yards, and I'll kind of get to the bottom. Um, and there will be almost no bugs. Then I'll get down to South Junction, and the bugs will be really thick again. And then I'll go like two miles, and I'll skip down to like Axford Island and the bugs will be thick and then they'll die off again. And I'll go another two miles and the bugs will be really thick. And so it'll be this like patchwork um, of hatch. Um, so it still does go up river. Um, like I said, the bugs are more prevalent in the mopping area right now than in Warm Springs, but probably tomorrow or the next day, it's gonna have equalized or pretty close to it, I would bet. Um, so, you know, this, this kind of list of things that I kind of disagree with, um, we'll talk about it as we kind of move through this, but, um, I still agree with those things and I definitely do all of that. I fish right next to the bank. I do fish a short leader. I do fish a chubby Chernobyl and I do fish a dry dropper. So that stuff is still very important to me. And you can see right here, tall bank right against the grass, uh, fish on bang. And that is, you know, that's the bottom line. That's what you're looking for. 
And those fish like to stage up under that tall grass or under those overhanging alders where they know um, the big bugs are gonna be. So, you know, like I was talking about, historically Memorial Day to the 4th of July, like I said, I could basically set my fly fishing clock to that. Um, that's changed now. And, uh, you know, I'm not gonna go into a huge depth or detail about this, but, you know, in 2000, basically 2011, that round butte mixing tower went online. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, um, but it has changed the hatch, you know, essentially forever. And what it does is, you know, I, I don't know, you know, part of this tower is this relicensing plan. One of the things that they do is they warm up the water sooner, which, you know, has caused the hatch to happen much sooner. The part of the things that they do, it's to promote smolt out migration. I don't know if that helps or not, uh, but it definitely has changed the um, the hatch. You know, it happens sooner. It happens much faster. Um, fishing is still very good, um, but it's a bummer that it happens like that. And quite frankly, basically all the hatches happen at once. So, you know, right now we will have the salmon fly hatch, but we'll have basically all the PEDs and PMDs will hatch at the same time. A lot of the caddis will hatch at the same time. So it's a, just all of a sudden has become a very weird time out there. Um, you know, I kind of, like I said, I don't want to dwell on that a lot, but that's just kind of an idea. So now the fishing is starts today. Basically today is the first day we've had guys coming into the shop for the past two weeks asking if the hatch has started yet. And people up until recently, people were still committed to the idea that, that it was going to be a Memorial day till the 4th of July kind of thing. And a lot of people were missing it. People now have figured out that it's, it's definitely a thing and it does happen earlier. And hence people are like, it happens earlier every year. It's going to happen today. Um, so, you know, it does change a little bit, but it's just, it's always going to be around the 10th or the 11th is going to be the first day. So, you know, the easy spots to fish where it's just a low sloping bank with tall grass, that's basically where everyone's going to fish. Uh, I'm going to try to skip those places. Uh, you can see this picture uh, is basically, he's standing in a little hole between the alders and had to cast up under the alders uh, to get this fish. And um, I'm sitting upstream looking down at him. Um, the other, so that fish came from pointing up at me. But after he fished that, he has this presentation into that deep dark um, below him that's gonna be under those overhanging alders. So when I'm thinking about fishing, and where I'm gonna fish, a lot of times I'm looking for hard to reach spots, spots where people can't really get to, spots where <clears throat> the wading is difficult. Some people call it jungle water or commando fishing, spots where no man is ever gonna go, doesn't wanna go, a smart person wouldn't go there. A lot of times I'm in a drift boat, so maybe I can row the drift boat right up to a rock and make someone get out in the middle of the river on a rock. And then I row off and have to come back and pick them up. Maybe the run is surrounded by poison oak or something like that. I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of interesting places where people can't really fish. And that's really what I'm gonna be looking for. Excuse me just one sec. As I get further along in the hatch, I'm gonna kind of look for these wide open places where I can see the riffle pushes way out off of the bank. And I can see that if, as the hatch progresses, <clears throat> the salmon flies fly and lay eggs out in the middle of the river. And when they do that, they will get caught in these big seams. I don't know if you can see that seam way out there, but they'll get caught in that seam 
and they'll get carried out into the middle of the river and trout will stage up out in those seam lines and feed on those fit on those flies that are just trapped in the current and can't get out of it. So, you know, one of the things that I'm looking for are places like that, or it's off the point of a little bank that has a little outcropping and a seam runs off of it. So I'm trying to look for any place that's different that's just not a flat with tall grass on it or some overhanging alders. I want it to be more challenging where most people aren't going to be able to go and just catch any any fish out of. I want these like steep cliff banks and where you're having to like feed it down under or maybe you have to stop in the middle of the river and hop out on a gravel bar or some some crazy thing like that. Um, last year, you know, I was talking about this particular fishing situation. And I don't know if you can see, but that big bush off to his left is just a huge clump of poison oak. It was kind of this poison oak like death machine where if you, when he hooked this fish, he's trying to get position on it and he's like trying to wade over and he wants to put his hand on that bush and it's poison oak. So he's like, oh my God, where, where can I go? And then now it's just a tug of war full on battle. But when I'm fishing in these places and I'm just standing in the bow of the drift boat, taking pictures, looking down on him. But you can see he's like on the edge of a cliff. He's surrounded by, um, you know, overhanging alders and there's no real place for him to fish. And this is, this is a run um, down below, you know, between Trout Creek and Moppin. This is on a, in a place we call the Golden Wall. It's a huge cliff band that goes for about two miles and you're sitting right under the railroad grade. So it's just steep, steep cliff right to the water. And, you know, when I get out and make people fish things like this, the fishing is difficult, but it can be very rewarding. And when we get out into these kind of positions, you know, I'm thinking about what kind of presentation, where is the fish going to be? What kind of casting are we going to be doing? So this particular spot, um, the fish was basically straight out in front of him. So we kind of had this perimeter fishing going on where, you know, you're flipping the leader and five feet of fly line and just barely flipping it up in front of you and out and just fishing that just real close in. But as I'm fishing in this particular spot even, you know, after he gets this fish in, you know, he's gonna turn around and try to send some upriver above us and fish this classic upstream where it's coming right down to him and he's stripping in the line till it gets down and when it eats the classic hook set. And then, you know, we're gonna basically do a downstream feed which is one of the most deadly uh, presentations you can do in the salmon fly hatch. You know, that's when you have a hard time casting up under these alders that are overhanging, or there's only like six, 10, 12 inches where you couldn't even get your fly to turn over underneath them. You just stand above it and shake out line and the fly goes under the trees and you don't need to make the cast, you just need to be able to set the hook and rip it back out of there. And for me, I find that in a lot of these crazy tight positions, you know, I do this little puddle cast and start shaking out line and feeding it down under the trees that I get a lot of fish doing that. Um, you're never false casting over them. You're presenting always the fly first. So they're not seeing the leader they're not seeing the fly line. You're not running all that stuff right over their head. So getting that downstream feed figured out is really great. And then, you know, when I get into this time frame where the bugs are flying, I'm really going to do the classic up and across or up and out where you're casting up river and across like at a 45 and you're sending it out there as far as you can. And, you know, those are going to be my four presentations. Um, there's kind of a, a fifth one. Maybe it's not a presentation. Maybe it's just a cast, but 
uh, bow and arrow. And a lot of times we'll be commando crawling through the trees and you can poke your head out through the bushes and or you can get your tip to go through and you kind of pull a bow and arrow back and launch it out. And that that would be maybe my fifth presentation, but it's kind of a cast. So those are kind of going to be a lot of my presentations that I'm thinking about doing. And once you basically can master strip and hook set, you're going to be in a pretty good shape there. Uh, you're going to be able to, to, to get a lot more fish. You can see this is um, one of those places. This fish came from way above that grass clump um, on, out in that seam off the point of that alder up above him. Um, you know, it's not always are the fish back behind you under the bushes, although they like to be in that spot. Uh, they do come from just kind of everywhere and anywhere. Um, in my mind, the one biggest, greatest thing you can do for yourself, and please don't take this the wrong way, uh, is learn how to cast. Learn all of the casts that I'm about to tell you. Master them, and your salmon fly hatch will your salmon fly hatch fishing, all of your trout fishing will become uh, just change for the better. So that bow and arrow that I was talking about, you're basically gonna hold your fly in your hand and just your leader out, and you're just gonna shoot it just like a bow and arrow. It turns over, you know, 10 feet off the tip of your fly rod. Um, I use that quite a bit this time of year, but where I, am mostly going to use that is uh, in the in the weeks after the salmon fly hatch when we're fishing a lot of little mayflies and we're stocking back eddies. You might not be able to cast and a lot of time when you do an overhead cast your fly line slams into the water but a lot of times we can sneak up on them and you don't false cast you're just flipping it right out over the top of them and the fly lands extremely delicately. They're never seeing the line flash over their head. Uh, you get to be a lot more effective with that. Uh, being able to do a long roll cast where if you're, or kind of a spay cast per se, if your back is up against these big steep banks, you know, we have all these railroad grades that we're fishing under. If your back is up against that steep bank and you can't do a back cast, being able to figure out how to roll cast it out there is going to be a huge thing. Um, even when you're in tight fishing situations, a roll cast is going to be a really good uh, cast. Probably the one of the two most important casts you can learn for the salmon fly hatch, uh, the curve cast. And if you are not familiar with it, you should Google it. But basically what you're going to do is a sidearm cast and you're going to overpower it and make a really hard stop so that when the fly line comes around, when you stop, it's going to pitch and go under the trees or bushes. And, you know, a lot of times if you're trying to fish under an overhang and you just cast straight over your head, the fly line goes into the bushes, not under them sideways. And so... Being able to, to do a curve cast is going to be as the, probably the most beneficial cast you can do. Um, puddle cast, if you're doing the downstream feed, a puddle cast, you basically do a forward cast, but instead of turning it all the way over, you dump it into a puddle in front of you, it lands in a big zigzag and it feeds downstream with as much slack as possible. Um, so to master the uh, downstream feed, the puddle cast is a good one. Uh, if you're doing a lot of wide open uh, fishing mid-river, this aerial mend or reach cast is going to be very helpful for you. You're basically going to cast it across, move your rod upstream so it puts the fly line upstream of your fly, and you will get a longer presentation and uh, a much better presentation. Uh, you know, spay cast, snake roll, single spay, 
this picture, this actually is a single spay that's happening here, but you can get a lot of distance. You generate a lot of line speed uh, being able to do a spay cast. Um, and the cast that I don't really have on, the cast that I don't have on here uh, is a backhand cast. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, but you guys know how to cast. You do a forward cast, but you release it backwards. And when you're fishing on river left, you know, uh, kind of the abnormal side, and you're trying to cast across, you know, across your body, if you just turn around, and release behind you, you will have a much greater distance and be able to cast much, much further. Um, so if I were to learn really two casts, it would be that mastering that backhand and that curve cast. Those are gonna be like the best possible cast you guys could figure out. Um, so yeah, fishing, you know, having your presentation down, but if you can't cast and get your fly to where the fish are, you know, you're gonna have a hard time. Um, being able to cast far is not necessarily gonna win, um, but being able to cast on target uh, as effectively and efficiently as possible. One of the things, if you have a hard time with these curve casts and sidearm and all that kind of stuff, you're gonna find that you have your flies in the bushes quite a bit, and you're gonna go through a lot of flies. Um, but one of my secrets that I would tell you is to have a lot of you you kind of come out on the winning end of that. Uh, that's the merman again, and he's doing a bow and arrow, uh, kind of right up under this. So you can't really tell in this picture. It looks like it's wide open, but there's no real back cast room, and he's just shooting one up under this uh, little alder and rapidy section. Um, the bow and arrow cast is kind of a funny, a funny, funny cast. You don't really think about what it is what it is until you start to do it and you start to master it and then it's like becomes such a great tool for you um tackle i mean this is tackle is tackle you know what i take i take like three rods with me every time i take m typically mostly five weights but i'll take a six weight i want a very powerful weight forward fly line something that i can turn over with authority uh, get those big flies to turn over, to flip over, um, and to be able to land them where I want. Um, I take a lot of tippet and I take a lot of floating. Uh, if my flies don't float, I'm typically not in the game. Uh, in reality, I mostly fish a nine foot five weight, um, and I feel like that's that's kind of the best tool for me for the job. Um, the leader and tippet. Um, I really, even though a lot of times I say I don't use a seven and a half footer, I, I do use a seven and a half footer. I also use a 12 footer. So I'll rig up two or three rods. Um, one will have a seven and a half footer. So I can do this real short in close under the trees, turns over wherever I want. I'm not trying to get a long drift with it. So I don't need it to have a lot of tippet, but I do want it to land exactly where I want it to land. And that seven and a half footer is going to help me do that. Uh, if I'm trying to get a long drift like the downstream feed, or I'm trying to get it out and across in the current, I'm going to use that 12 footer because a long leader is going to enable you to get these extra long drifts. When you make your cast, the leader lands in a zigzag. And so it has time to straighten out while it's fishing. Uh, most of my fishing, I'm going to just use 3X. 3X is strong. It enables me to land my flies in the bushes and I can just tear them out and I don't have to think about it. And uh, if they break off, so be it. I have a lot of 3X and I have a lot of flies with me so I can quickly tie one on and not have to worry too much about it. Um, I mentioned this earlier. In the beginning of the hatch, um, the dry dropper seems to be a very effective. A lot of people ask me if I use it. I'm going to tell you, no, I don't use it. Uh, but maybe I do use it. In the beginning, the dry dropper is very good. And at the end of the hatch, the dry dropper is very good. But when I am, um, when I'm fishing the middle of the hatch, 
like prime time, the dry dropper, the dropper is just a hindrance for me. It's hanging two feet behind my fly. I make my cast under a tree. My fly turns over and then this little boomerang is hanging on the back or like grappling hook or anchor or whatever it is. My fly goes into the right place. This little fly is trailing behind it and hooks over the branch and the alder. I can see it's hanging and my salmon fly is dangling and never made it to its target. <clears throat> so the, my dropper is gonna be tied on with 5X. So I yank it out of there, it breaks off. I get my fly back, I tie another one on, make the next cast and five, five droppers later, I'm like, this is a terrible idea. So the reality of it is during the actual hatch, I'm not gonna use a dropper. Uh, it becomes more of a problem. I, I don't need it. Um, and I promise you, you're, you're going to catch probably more fish because you're not spending so much time uh, trying to fix or rebuild that setup. Um, salmon fly hatch, like I said, is the uh, is a run and gun kind of commando mission. This is basically exactly what it looks like. Uh, that's my whole kit right there. I have my tippet. I have a couple liters in my pocket. I have a whole bunch of flies, uh, hook file, nippers, and my floating. And uh, maybe I have a couple more things, but um, that's about it. I actually typically carry two floatants with me. Um, I do like a, a paste, like the payette paste. I used to use mucilin, uh, but mucilin is really hard to get. Um, and I'll use the mucilin in wings to kind of mat them down and, and make them like clumpy. Um, so they lay really low over the fly. Um, that's basically what my fly selection looks like. Uh, if you've come into the shop before, you've probably seen it. I have like um, a huge Tupperware of, of one salmon fly that I tie in about 10 colors. Um, you know, it's orange and brown and black and whatever, but it's uh, called the Miffer. It's like a Normwood special kind of um, knockoff. Um, but if you've probably fished the salmon fly hatch, you're familiar with this particular pattern. This is a chubby Chernobyl. Um, works really good. It's possibly the most popular salmon fly. Uh, works good. It floats like a top. I hate it. I don't ever fish it. Uh, it just, it, something about it just bugs me. I hate it. Um, I know that it works, but I would personally just not use it. Although sometimes I do use it. Um, there's a little purple chubby in that guy's mouth. I like to use something that's maybe a little more realistic, um, something that is not as impressionistic. Uh, the thing where a chubby really succeeds is in heavy broken water, where it's a lot of like bubbly white water, kind of at a rapid or the edge of a, the head of a riffle, something like that, because it's foam and it just floats really well. Um, these are all good patterns. You know, I don't know that there's one uh, best, you know, but those are some some old classics and new favorite kind of things. Um, you know, in my mind, I'm looking for a salmon fly. I like foam, it floats, so I wanna have a hybrid. I like them to be low riders because most of the time salmon flies are kind of half sunk in the water. Um, and I want it to be more realistic looking, so. You know, that's kind of what I fish is something like that. Or really I fish a hybrid of a Normwood Special is my go-to. Uh, this is kind of a, a manufactured Normwood Special. This is a Idlewild or a Montana Fly Company version. Um, looks a lot different than what a real Normwood Special looks like, which I don't know what's wrong with that picture, but that's an actual Normwood Special. It's like the trashiest looking fly. It's the tips of the of the calf tail are like cut square and yeah, it's like the funniest fly if you'd ever seen it you would not believe it's that good of a fly but i use the fly on the right it's called a miffer and it has been very successful for me it's a foam body with a lot of hackle um it looks ratty uh fishes very well and is a low rider kind of fly um and it it works it's proven for me um, and it, like I said, it is my go-to. One of the things that, you know, makes it successful for me is, you know, as I've been fishing and I kind of have developed the way 
I like it to fish and I like what it does and I can see it really well, you know, and I cut all the hackle off the bottom. Um, I put a lot of floating on it. I put muslin or payette paste in the wing. I uh, put loxa or aquel or gink on the body. Um, I feel like it looks like Hank asked a question. Uh, salmon fly or golden stone. My, my chat bar is half covered up, so I can't read all of the message, Hank. But um, what I would say is it's a 50 50 of what is um, being used. Um, my, the flies that I find to be the best are maybe a little more ambiguous. They don't specifically look like both flies look very similar. A golden has a more big round head. Uh, salmon fly has kind of a little more pointy head. Salmon flies are typically a little bit bigger, more black and orange, where the golden is more of a golden brown color. I find that I just have a fly that lands kind of somewhere in between, and I tie it a little bit darker and a little bit lighter. And that way, if they're not liking one, I can switch to the other, and it seems to be a, a pretty good method. A Normwood special is definitely a golden stone. Um, you know, he was an angler that guided and fished down below. And, you know, this that Normwood special is basically synonymous with the Deschutes. Uh, but you have other flies like sofa pillows, which are uh, much bigger, more like a salmon fly. And, you know, it's, it's kind of whatever you want. Now, if you're fishing mostly down around Moppin, you have a lot more golden stones. So I would put a little more focus on that kind of pattern if it were me. Um, and I find that that is, is going to be the thing to do. Now, you know, one little caveat here about flies. And for myself personally, I take, if I go on a three-day trip, I bring 100 flies with me, let's say. I don't know how many I bring, it's a lot. And the great thing about that is I am never going to worry about, this is my last fly. This is the last miffer that I have. I can't lose this one because I won't have another. When you get to that point where you have a limited amount of flies, you're not gonna be as cavalier with where you cast your fly. I have an unlimited supply, so I don't care if I lose them. I don't care if I put it into a tree or if I put it in, if I float it under a log and I don't get it back, I because I have enough flies. And if the, the one true thing that holds you back from casting or trying a little bit harder is that you don't have enough flies, you should always have more flies. That's like the, the flies and tippet are like the most consumable good that we have in fly fishing. If you have bad tippet, throw it away. Don't hold on to it forever. Make sure you have more flies than you need. And that's not a sales pitch. That's just, that's the reality of it. When I'm out there, if I only have one salmon fly and I break it off and it's like the best one, I reel up and go home because my day is done. So um, I'll get kind of get off my soapbox at this point, but uh, have leader, have tippet that's fresh, have three X, have a lot of it, and don't be afraid to change it out and just keep ripping it off the spool and breaking it off and tying on new stuff. Uh, it only takes a second to retie. Um, cast as aggressively as you can with those big bugs. Throw them into the bushes. Do whatever you want, but put them put them in every place where no man has gone before. And I think you'll find that you're going to be a lot more successful with that. Um, catching and fishing. I think as long as you kind of really start fishing that harder water, uh, you're going to have a lot more success and, and be better with it. And having, you know, good, strong tippet and a lot of flies is going to make you much more successful. Um, you know, I kind of skipped over this point earlier, but a lot of times I'll get done fishing and I'll see someone at the takeout and they'll be like, oh, how was your fishing? And we'll be like, oh, man, we had the best day today. You know, I don't know how many we caught. We caught 100. And we got them. And they're like, oh, what did you get them on? I'm like, oh, salmon fly. And they're like, oh, you got them all on the nymphs? And I'm like, no, we just got them on dry flies. 
And, you know, they'll proceed to tell me that they didn't fish a dry fly because they didn't see any fish coming up for dries. And I'm like, well, I didn't see any coming up either, but I just, it's the time. So I'm just casting and fishing and I'm kind of making my own luck if, as you know, if you will. Um, but I don't, I know that basically starting on the 10th, I'm only going to rig up a dry fly and that's what I'm going to fish the whole time. Whether I see fish coming up or not, I'm going to have basically blind faith that it's time. And if I get my fly in the water, a fish is probably going to eat it. Um, it's just, it's that time. And so, you know, it's one of those things that if you're not fishing a dry fly, you're not going to catch one on a dry fly. I mean, that's kind of the bottom line right there. And so, um, I'm, I try to be extremely aware of that. Um, I try and run and gun. I move into a lot of spots covering as much water as possible, trying to fish as much different water as possible. I find that um, for me, the salmon fly hatch, I don't know if you can tell these guys have, this is an indicator picture I know, but this is kind of the beginning of the hatch, but it's such a great fun time out there that you're catching so many fish that this, the happiness in this picture is kind of what it does for me. And that salmon fly hatch is <clears throat> far and away the funnest time of year. And you're catching a lot of fish. You're seeing fish eat all over the place. I mean, it's just a magical, exciting moment. Um, so, you know, get out there and go. Uh, that's the biggest piece of advice I can give to you. Uh, there, there will be fish eating big bugs. It will be a good time. Um, and it's just one of those uh, great times in general. So salmon fly hatch basically starts uh, today, tomorrow, or the next day. Um, I would say get out there and go and uh, have some big bugs, have some 3X. Uh, go where you know. If you don't, go out and explore. Uh, go to the Deschutes. Anywhere top to bottom is going to be great and uh, don't give up. So I think that is basically my presentation for you guys. Nicely done. Uh, I kind of had to run through it a little bit. I was going to start wandering. <laughs> uh, I could ramble on about salmon fly hatch for days. Believe me, Joel hears it. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions uh, for Josh, go ahead and unmute your uh... Your computer and feel free to, to uh, chime in. Hey, thanks, Josh. I appreciate your, this presentation. What about the waters below Moppin? You didn't. You you said you did fish. You just fished above it in Trout Creek and Warm Springs. Yeah, great, great having you on here, Alex. Uh, I'll tell you what, man. Um, yeah, that's it's just uh, where I run. You know, it's just where I roam. Is that Warm Springs to Moppin? Um, I fish below mopping a lot in the winter time. Um, it, the hatch definitely happens down there. Um, like I said, it's more goldens. I know that it's the front end of it right now. And you can find uh, salmon flies happening from top to bottom um, on the Deschute. So anywhere that you like to go, okay. uh, the hatch is not as prolific down below, but it still can be really good. Yeah, I was headed over there Saturday and I don't want, I want to be, I'm sure there's going to be a big crowd about mopping and above. And so I was going to be headed down towards uh, where you had the last single of the mile. Oh, down. yeah, at Beaver Tail. Right. And I had some pretty good luck right in there. It, you know what I'll tell you? Um, you know, it's a salmon fly hatch. It can be bring your own rock situation at times. Um, it's good everywhere. People love to go top to bottom. Um I mean, fish are in the water. You catch them wherever you catch them. So yeah. I would say do it. Well, thank you. Thanks, Joe, for this. Please. Hey, Josh, when you fish, hey. when you fish a dropper, what dropper do you fish? Um, well, that's a funny question. There's been times where uh, on the Deschutes, if the salmon fly hatch fishing is good, I'll put another salmon fly on as a dropper um, and fish two salmon flies. But <laughs> most oftentimes... Uh, I'll either fish like a caddis kind of pupa or a little mayfly. Uh, a lot of times now that um, Sylvie's super sinker type fly is really good. 
Sylvie's uh, caddis pupa is a really good one. I fish a lot of like, I don't know if you've seen the flies that we have here, like the uh, drag queen or the mic drop or any of those. Well, I'll fish a lot of those. Those droppers are really good. Just wondering, no problem. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, Josh, I thank you for uh, your presentation. Um, I, I especially like the parts that kind of uh, fly in the face of what has been conventional wisdom. And uh, one of those is, you know, the fact that you're throwing dries all day, even if you're not seeing fish rising. I'm just curious, uh, I think probably a lot of us have heard, you know, fish, uh, fish nymphs in the morning, at least until the day starts to warm up. Do you start chucking dries early or do you delay, delay your start a bit? What about the time of day? You know, that's a great question. Great, great having you on here, bud. Thanks, man. Um, yeah, heck yeah. Uh, I'll tell you, um, when, when I, so honestly, when I go from here on out, maybe, maybe this weekend will be the transition time. So I might still nymph this weekend. But after this weekend, when I go, I'll take three rods. I'll have all three rigged up, and they will all three be rigged with dry flies. And I will, when I get to the water, the first place I fish will be with the dry fly, and the last place I fish will be with the dry fly. Um, just that's just the way that I do it because they're not not keyed in on them. I mean, they want them. You know, you want a steak, you want a steak. That's the bottom line. And they're opportunistic, so they're just going to eat them when they do, in my mind. Yeah, you might do – I don't know that you'll do better or worse um, with the nymph or not fishing a nymph because once it's time, it's time. You know what I mean? So I just switch over and don't look back. Yeah, thanks for that, man. If, if there had been an admission price, I think that that tip alone was worth the cost of admission. So um, <laughs> thanks to Joel and, and you for making this happen. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for being here. It's been too long since we've seen you. Yeah, you'll probably see me tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I was planning to come even before I knew the presentation was happening. So, More 3X tip it, right? <laughs> yeah. I saw that uh, Dylan and Will were on just a minute ago, and that's exactly what they said. Yeah. Thanks for the presentation. We need more 3X tip it. Yeah, um, real quick, Joel and Josh. Yeah. You guys have plenty of inventory on those flies, I'm assuming, correct? You've, you've have, spent uh, months prepping for this? We do. We're getting low on some because there's been a big, like, jump on it already. People have been coming in for weeks uh, already buying salmon flies. Like I said, there have been people, like, three weeks ago, like, is the hatch on already? I'm like, are you crazy? It's not even May yet. Um, so uh, we, ha we have a huge selection. We have a great amount of them. One or two, like the Miffer, we could be running low on. Yeah, um, but, but other than that, I know where his Tupperware contained. <laughs> <laughs> it's locked in my safe at home now. I'm pretty sure Joel's been selling them on the side when I'm not looking. <laughs> I've been putting them in my fly box. <laughs> you better tie so, some up before you leave the shop tonight, Josh. Uh, right, <laughs> exactly. Um, so hold on there, excuse me one sec. There's a question from John from Portland that says, uh, fish the early a.m. or slow start. That is a great, really great question. Um, to be honest with you, I'm, I'm not going to say that I'm lazy, but during the salmon fly hatch, if I'm going over for a day trip, I'm not going to show up till 10 o'clock. And the re there's, but there's one specific reason behind this. I want to be behind everyone I don't want to be caught up with the crowd where every time I go to move to the next spot, everyone else is moving. And then all of a sudden I've moved two miles to find my next rock. So I find that if I can get there around 10 o'clock, get my waders on, get the boat in the water. And now it's like 10, 30, 45. And I'm now pushing away from the bank. Uh, so this also, Greg, kind of answers your other question a little bit. So I might have misled you. But um that's on a day trip. Now, uh, when I'm floating um, Trout Creek down, when I get up first thing in the morning, um, I'll be catching them on dries at, you know, six, not 6.30, but like 7.30 in the morning. So same deal. Um, Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs>
that looks like David Weber has a question. Uh, I'm walking the bank. I'm thinking of five weight for a 12 foot leader. Yeah, uh, or vice versa is the way I would go on that one. All right. Uh, yeah, five weight with the um, short leader. So it's real easy to cast under. Uh, six weight with the long leader. So you have much more authority for your turnover and you can cast it much further. Yeah, that would be my take on it. All right, thank you. Yeah. Any more questions, thoughts, chat, jabs at me? Good job, Josh. You throw any? Do you throw any other any other dries other than the other than the stone flies during during these weeks, like in the evening? If there's a caddis hatch, I don't know if the caddis are out as you know as much of an evening caddis hatch, but as as we get a little bit later, uh, it's a good idea to have some green drakes, especially if you get a little cloud cover, because you can have both salmon flies and green drakes popping at the same time, and that can be a pretty epic day. Yeah, when I floated on uh, Sunday, I saw two green drakes come off, and I saw one salmon fly. And that is the um, definitely one of the things that you see um, happening on, on the Deschutes. And, and it's really interesting now with the, the new mixing tower, you would see a green drake sporadically. Like, oh, look, there's five coming off and then you would never see it anymore and then you know the next day you would see like five coming off and there would be no more now you float down the river and you're like oh, there is actually a hatch going off pull over stop the boat and let's fish to it and it becomes a real thing um so that's definitely one of the things that the um the salmon fly that the mixing tower is affected uh the green drakes are definitely more prolific uh caddis happen uh, I mean, you could fish, you know, any of these um, coinciding hatches at the same time if you didn't want to focus on uh, the the salmon flies. So PMDs and PEDs are definitely coming off at the same time. I see them. You could go stock back eddies and fish them and be very successful at it um, at that time and kind of omit and have a more technical fishery that a lot of people aren't even looking at because it's not a salmon fly fishery. So sure, absolutely. What's your, tell me what your third rod is rigged with. I got the five weight and the short leader, the six weight and the long leader. What's the third one rigged with? Oh, you know what? Uh, that's a funny, good question. Uh, my third one is rigged with another long leader so that when I break off, I just can grab another rod and not have to worry about tying it back on. <laughs> uh, yeah, speed wins. The longer you keep your fly in the water, the better off you're going to be. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. Heck yeah. Well, it looks like we're wrapping it up. Cool. Great questions, guys. Thanks. Yeah. Well, Josh, thank, thank you for uh, sharing this today and uh, I'm sure we'll see you in the shop in the next few days but uh, and I'll see you first thing in the morning sounds good yeah hopefully we see you guys I look forward to it thanks for a great presentation thank you thanks for tuning in folks appreciate it <laughs> always, Rick always thanks Joel thanks Josh thanks Joel you're welcome thanks guys uh, <laughs> nice Rick uh, hopefully I see you soon, buddy. You bet. Take care. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. All right, Josh. See you in the morning, buddy. Yep. Sounds great, guys. Thanks.